We're in class number nine here in the series that we started um, about money. We haven't actually touched the money issue yet because there's several optics, I believe, that we need to grasp and understand before we start dealing with it because of the power of it, because of the deception that is in it, the deceitfulness that goes with it, and, and all of the, the, the um, issues that come with money. I think it's very important that we get our optic right first before we, we go there. Also, there's a tendency when we deal with stuff is to run in and try and grab God's blessing uh, like a, a genie in a lamp and rub it and use it for our um, for our uh, worldly optic on it. And we've got we to fix optics first. Uh, if you want God to bless us, want God to be involved in it, we've got to get God's optics. So we started here talking about money some um, nine, uh, eight hours ago. We talked about how the God made the earth and everything that's in it, he owns it and all of it. And so everything that's down here is a resource. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you. It never did, never will. You come into the world naked, you're going to leave the world naked. So it's not what you have, it's what you do with what you have. Really, in God's optic, that's what it's all about. It's, so it's what you do with it. It's not, not what you get. It's what you do with what you got. That, that's really what it's all about. It's all about management. If God's going to give you anything in this life, it'll be because you can manage it. God will not give you what you cannot manage. Matthew 25 says to 1-5, to 1-2, to 1-1, to each man severally according to their ability to manage it. And then he took it from the one who wouldn't do anything with it and give it to the one who would do something with it because God will give his resources to managers. And so it's all about the management of resource. That's what, what we are. We're stewards of, managers of God's stuff. Now, we know that because we're believers, but most people in the world don't understand that. They think it's mine. They think it's ours. They think I got it. They think it belongs to me. And the truth is it doesn't belong to any of us. It's only a stewardship. So we talked here in, in Psalm 115. It says, You're blessed of the Lord that made the heaven and the earth. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's. But the earth hath he given to the children of men. Man's in charge of this. God set it up that way. God put man in charge of the earth. God himself put those rules there, and he won't break them. He won't even break them himself. He set it up that way because we're made in God's image and after God's likeness. And he put us here to govern it. And so when God wants to get involved in the world in which we live, he, he obeys his own rules. And so he will never do it without going through man. That's why we had the incarnation. That's why God had to become flesh in order to deal with the issues and fix the problems that man had found himself in. And so man is in charge. Man's the governor of the earth and that's a very important truth and that governance has never changed even though man fell man's still governing the devil is not governing God is not governing God owns it but man governs it God owns it and and man governs it and the devil doesn't own it but the devil usurps his his will uh, uh, over man's governance because man yielded to him and became uh, subject to sin. And so we took up this whole uh, thing about usurping, and that's what the devil did. He's not in charge here. Man's still in charge, but man under sin is influenced by this usurper. And to usurp is an, an illegitimate or a controversial claimant to power. Often, but not always in a monarchy, in other words, a person who takes the power of a country, a city, or established region for themselves without any formal or legal right to claim it as their own. And that's exactly what Satan done. Man yielded himself, bowed his knee to this fallen cherub, and that cherub became his master. And so man, although he's still the, 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 the dominator of the world, he's still the governor of the world according to God's decree, which hasn't changed, but Satan influences man's governance. Man was always meant to be under the authority of God, and, and under that authority, he was to govern from it. But now with God out of, the, out of the scene, with a fallen cherub influencing man's governance, things didn't go right. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And so the world that we see, and is mentioned in the Word of God, comes up in three forms. The world, which is the terra firma, or the planet we live on, 
the world or a system that operates within that terra firma and the people of the world, both on the planet and that operate in the systems. God tells us that we're to, you know, uh, love not the world. And what he's talking about is that middle one, which is the system. He doesn't want us to love that world because it's broken. Man in his governance, man in his dominance, under the influence of sin, didn't do a good job of it. He's done a bad job of it. And God's always been trying to fix it. His intent was always to come down and fix man's ability to govern and dominate the world correct. Which is what all of redemption is about. It's why Jesus came teaching, behold, the kingdom is at hand. Why? Because the kingdom hadn't been around since Adam fell. Does that make sense? It was operational while Adam was under the, the influence of God, but when, when, when Adam sinned, the kingdom, as God intended it, and as Adam experienced it, it didn't exist. When Jesus came along, it was to reintroduce that ability to dominate and to govern the world as was intended by God. So, he tells us not to love the world. And yet the Bible says God loves the world. He doesn't love that middle piece, the system, but he loves the people in it. And so when we read that in Scripture, don't, don't confuse you, understand what he's talking about. So we talked about how that the world then, in, as we live today, has two different systems in it. We talked about that, that Satan is the god of the system. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4 that he is the god of this world system. And so there is a system here. There's a governance set up here that has come under the influence of Satan. But since the resurrection of Jesus and the introduction of the church, there's a new system in town. It's called the kingdom. And the church are advocates and ambassadors that represent that new kingdom which has been reintroduced to the planet. And so there are two different kingdoms here and they operate in two different sets of laws. Everybody with me? And man work, work, operates in one or the other. But we do have the ability to operate in a new way of thinking. And that's what the Christian life wrong. I'm, I'm going to opt out of Christian for a minute. That's what the believer's life is about. Okay? Now, I brought these things out because th this is very, very important stuff. And I'm sorry that this sounds like a civics lesson. But we are part of a kingdom. And our problem in the church is we have mixed up who we are and what we're in. We have this idea that we are a, a Christian. Christian, in actual fact, was a derogatory term that was used for believers. It's not actually a positive term. It's a negative term that was used in scriptures for believers. It says, oh, that's that Christ follower crowd. It was a derogatory term. However, that, that whole term Christian, we optically see Christian as another religion. Because there's other Christians, uh, people that say that they follow Christ. Like, Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses and so on and so forth, they would uh, claim some um, uh, adherence to Christendom as, as, as in Christ as their leader um, and would be uh, termed as another religion. We are not a religion. I did not get born again into a Christian religion. I got born again into the citizenry of another kingdom. We've got to think kingdom minded and, and that's why I deviated into this before I'm not going to I will do a series on this uh, uh, later but uh, as I said sorry for the civics lesson but it's very very important for your optics especially when we're going to deal with money all things exist and are governed by laws now I'm not talking about forget the, 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 the Jewish laws and ceremonial laws that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about everything that's in the planet when God made it he, he made it to function a certain way there are laws that govern everything that's in the world. Everything. And we're going to find out that under, the, the, under Satan's uh, influence, we've screwed it all up. We, we, we don't fully understand those laws. But under the kingdom of God, we get to now understand how it works and avail of the principles better. So, all things exist and are governed by laws. Law 
a, a produce and establish order. When everything operates in its law, it functions accordingly. Order is the evidence of the presence of laws. Chaos is the absence of law and order. Disorder is a violation of those laws. When you see something broken or not working, it's, it's not that it's broken or, or it's, that it doesn't work. It's just that the laws aren't being adhered to. Everything God created is governed by its own set of laws. Built into these laws are the preservation and the protection of those things if those laws are obeyed. They're guaranteed. Just do what, the, do what it says. It works. God made it that way. Having said that, built into these laws are the, are the preservations that protect it, but in number eight, built into these laws are their own destruction if the governing principles are disobeyed or ignored. Does that all make sense? Just, just simple truth. The most important knowledge on the earth is law. It's the most important thing to know what things and how things work and then to operate them according to the built-in laws and they work. That's what a law is. A law is when you do something and every time you meet the standards or the conditions of it, it always works the same way. That's a law. The most important knowledge in there is law. Reading the Bible is not for devotions but to learn law. That's what that book is all about. This book is all about spiritual law and physical law, natural law and spiritual law. It's all here. All of it. It explains how everything works. It explains the boundaries and the parameters and the guardrails in which they operate. When you step outside of its boundary, step outside of its guardrail, it malfunctions. Relationships have guardrails. Families have guardrails. Spirituality has guardrails. Morality has guardrails. When you step outside of it, it destructs. It destructs the people who do it and the people who are affected by it. Stay within it, it blesses you. It, it prospers you and promotes you. And these are not just laws for Christians. These are laws for humanity. All with me. So, Devotions don't protect you from failure, but obedience to law does. We pick up the book to make us feel good. That's not what the book's for. It's help us fix the error that we've been raised in. Praying over seed doesn't make it grow. Planting it in watered soil and allowing its governing laws to operate are what makes it grow. So you can grab a seed and pray all day long. It won't grow. Say, well, I don't know. I prayed to God. God didn't do anything. He doesn't have to do anything. It's not down to God to do anything. It's down to me and you to find out what the laws and the principles of the things God give us stewardship over, the resources God give us, and apply those laws to it. It works. So I don't have to pray to God to get something to work in which is inherently built in laws. My, my job is just to obey it. Obedience. The most powerful force on earth is law. It just is. And the reason is, is because God decreed it, declared it, and made it so. And there's none of us here big enough, smart enough, and there's not a majority numerous enough to change it. Because God made those laws. All right. A law is a principle that always remains the same once the conditions and the requirements of that principle are met. Water boils at 100 degrees, freezes at zero degrees, so on and so forth. There's the law of thrust and lift. There's the law of gravity. They're all laws. Once the conditions are met, they always perform the same. That's what a law is. A law can only be proved. It cannot be changed. I'm not big enough, smart enough, and don't have the authority or the power to change it. Now, we're talking about God's laws. Now, when we talk about man's laws, that's a different thing. Man's laws keep changing all the time. In fact, some people tended to wear a mask and don't wear a mask. But they made the law that you're supposed to. We find out when men make laws, 
men think they can change them all the time or that the laws are for you and not for me when God made laws even when God made laws for the children of Israel did you know that when Moses went up and got the, the ten instructions that God gave them and came down and read them there wasn't number 11 which said hey oh by the way number 11 says I'm God's man I'm his main man and you got to give me the respect and the honor that I'm due no Moses was subject to the same ten principles as the rest of the people to whom he read it to does that make sense we're all subject to God's laws Moses didn't make them up God gave them to him and Moses was subject to them men's laws are different when men make laws they 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 formulate and change them to suit themselves they're not the laws we're talking about they're not the laws we're going to deal with we're going to deal with God's laws kingdom laws they are much superior and a far higher set and regime than anything men can come up with heaven and earth is going to pass away but God's principles and laws will never pass away you also with me all right a law can only be superseded by a greater law that's that's it now I know this is a recap but I got to bring you here to take you where I'm going okay again a law is a principle that always remains the same once the condition and the requirement of that principle are met therefore obedience to the law is predictable if you boil water and it comes up to 98 99 you know when it gets to 100 degrees what's it going to do boil great name that anyway I'll you move on and um, it's going to boil it's predictable or if I drop the temperature and drop the temperature and drop the temperature and I get down to and I come down to zero what's going to happen freeze predictable laws are predictable therefore if we live our life according to law we can predict what's going to happen If you and I learn to live the, our life by kingdom laws, we can predict where we're going, what's happening. Therefore, disobedience to law is predictable. My assumption then is life is therefore predictable. Dependent on obedience or disobedience to God's laws. Does that make sense? All right. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the law the Lord is the king over sorry, and it is he who will save us. God's the lawgiver. James 4 says there is one lawgiver. When we talk about laws, I know we'll talk about human laws in a minute, but God's laws our laws he's got not just the I, I think I did this with you the last time I'm going to make a law this morning I've just decided that I'm going to make a law and that law is that none of you will ever pay tax again for the rest of your lives so many of you would love that for a law the thing about it is I don't have the authority to make it and I don't have the power to back it up so that's as good as <laughs> you know a three dollar bill it just it's not legal tender I can't I, but when God says something it's law God when he speaks his words are law you can't change them and because he's perfect he doesn't have to change them and because it's perfect and because he doesn't have to change him he doesn't have to keep saying them he only has to say them once and sometimes you wonder why God is quiet and the reason God's quiet is because he's already told us what we need to do and we don't need to hear it again we just need to find out what it was he said and do it when God's not saying anything he doesn't need to it's in the book just go do it God is not the author of confusion he, he or everything comes into order when when you start to listen to and adhere to God's principles let all things be done decently and in order Gosh, I don't know about you, but the new birth, when I got born again, it brought my life into order. It started, a, it took a while, and it's still, I'm working on areas, but boy, did it change my life. It just started to bring it into line 
with God's will for me. Romans 13, 1, let everyone be subject to the governing authority, for there is no authority that exists except that which God has established. In other words, if God says you can't, then you just can't. And if it, if it actually is running right now, then it's because God allowed it just to do what it does. So it only exists because God allows it to exist. The authorities that exist have been established by God. There is set a set of governance in the world. And God allowed that to happen. The whole purpose, if you read Romans 13, actually somebody just, somebody just go there and let me just explain this to you while I'm here. Romans the 13th chapter. Now you've got to remember, when Adam fell, that kingdom that God was talking about then um, couldn't happen. Because man was now, instead of being under the influence of God in order to have dominion and rule the earth, he now came under a fallen cherub. And so man's dominance of the world or governance of the world was distorted. And so the kingdom, as God intended, many of you know earth was a earth is a, a colonization of heaven. Heaven and earth operate the exact same. They're exactly the same. The reason are because we're made in God's image and likeness. And so we, we like the things God likes. We do the things God does. We're made in the same class. And so heaven and earth, are, are, they, they go together. Heaven and earth will, will, will operate. What you bind on, on earth is having been bound in heaven and so on and so forth. Every time you read one, when, when he, Jesus, when they ask Jesus, how do we pray? How do we talk to our heavenly father? He goes, well, here's how you do it. Our Father, which is in that other kingdom, we reverence your name. And our prayer is that that kingdom in heaven would now colonize itself here on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as you always intended it to be done, like it is in heaven. That, that's what he said to pray, because that was always God's intent. And from the moment Adam fell, God's job was to restore that kingdom. Jesus didn't come down to win for us a ticket to heaven. That was not why he came. We didn't fall from heaven. We fell from our position here, which was God's original intention for man. Jesus came down to fix that and put us back in the saddle, back in the driving seat where man was supposed to be. That's what Jesus came to do. That's why when Jesus came, he immediately started to teach what? Did you know Jesus only taught one message? Did you know that? The only message Jesus taught. taught the only message. He didn't teach any other message. The kingdom. That was it. He never taught another message. Jesus didn't teach on healing. Jesus didn't teach on money. He didn't do a series on any of that. He didn't do a series on anything except the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like kingdom of heaven is like oh let me give you another one kingdom of heaven is like I'll give you another one the kingdom of heaven is like all two that's all he taught he didn't teach anything else because that's what he came to restore the kingdom period period that's it that's what he came to do that's what he came to fix I, I said to go to Romans chapter um, 13 Somebody read verses 2, 3, and 4, please. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power to do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise for the same? What basically he's saying there is any authority that exists exists because God allows it to. And the reason God allowed man to continue in his governances, even though he was influenced by sin, was that God would indeed endeavor to raise up good governors, good governances, authoritatively, to keep evil suppressed. And that's why we have authority. So if you do good, you shouldn't be afraid of authority. And if you do bad, you should be terrified of it because they'll put you in prison or they'll blah, blah, blah. That's, and that's why God allows that to exist. Because until he can fix everything, he wanted man to have some means of fixing the issues when they arise. 
Does that all make sense? All right. So, Jesus didn't teach any other message. Uh, go to, and I'm going to deal with it in a minute. In Matthew 28, 18, it says, Then Jesus uh, came to them and said, All authority. Very important declaration. All, not some, most of it, all of it. I got it all back. All authority has been given on, on heaven and earth has been given to me. There's them two planets working together. Heaven and earth. I've got it back. I got it back for man. I, I got back what Adam lost. I, I fixed what Adam messed up. I have it now. I got it back. Origin of law. God's a lawgiver. God is a God of order. God is the source of all authority. Authority is the evidence that law exists. Do you understand that? In order to... <laughs> if there was no law, you don't need authority. The whole purpose of, an, of authority is to, is to enforce a law. When we talk about, when Christians talk about authority, in order for you to, to, to use a th kingdom authority, you have to understand kingdom what? Law. We're running around shouting stuff and decreeing stuff and declaring stuff and, and binding and loosening and we haven't a clue half the time of what we're doing. We, we thought somebody else said they did it and somebody else said it worked. More often than not, we're experimenting. We don't need to experiment. There are laws. And you don't exercise authority without understanding the law because laws fuel authority. So it says here, or I wrote here, authority is the evidence that a law exists. Authority is the outworking of laws. That's what the police are for. Authority is the enforcement of laws. Where law doesn't exist, there's nothing to enforce. Where laws don't exist, authority isn't necessary. Law precedes authority, which precedes power. Why do we need power? To enforce authority. Why do we need authority? To enforce a law. Are you still all with me? You don't need power if you don't have authority, if you don't know law. Law feeds authority, which feeds power. Law, authority, power. That's the way it works. The church... We find ourselves in a place where we, we read what it says about power or we read what it says about authority even and our problem is we don't have a, a kingdom optic when it comes to law. And it's very important that we do. Am I too deep on a Tuesday morning? <laughs> I'm sorry. But I just got to, I mean, you know what, what we do here at Bible Optics is, I, I call it like uh, that, uh, one of the educational programs, spiral learning. We'll come around and touch this and then in another series later on, we'll come around and address some of this stuff again, maybe drill down from a different, a different uh, uh, angle, and, but you, you'll grab it. it and, and some of it, you won't, you're not intended to get it all immediately, but what I'm trying to do is stimulate your thinking. I'm trying to stimulate you to start realizing that many times we just sort of sat there like fledglings in a nest and swallowed everything that they, they, they want to regurgitate. We don't need that. Study to show yourself approved to God. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of, the word of truth, the word of God. So, this is our recap. I'm going to get into the meat of what we're doing now in a minute. Jesus answered and said unto them, here's your problem. He was talking to the religious people. Here's your problem. 
You err because you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. You see the power, but that power is only the enforcement of authority, which is only the implementation of laws. And you don't understand that. That's why it doesn't work for you. You see it, you know it, you know he can, you know he does. But you don't operate it because you, you don't understand the laws. That's why you're, you're having the problem. For the kingdom of God is not just a bunch of words. The kingdom of God is power. Power is the enforcement of authority, and authority is the implementation of laws. So in order for any of it to work, you've got to go back and have the optic for, for kingdom law. Romans 1.16. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because it is a wonderful, encouraging, edifying, devotional. Is that what it says? It's a great Sunday morning place to gather for an hour and really make you feel good. Not at all. I'm not ashamed of it. It's, it's power. How many of you ever bought something that you plugged in and it didn't work? How disappointing was that? So you went to another outlet, you plugged in there, it still didn't work there. You shake it, you shook it, you, you read the instrument, put it back in, and it still didn't work. That's so frustrating. And I'll tell you what frustrated, frustrated me so, for so long in my Christian life was being a believer but not seeing power in my own life. I saw it. He did it for this and he did it for them. He did it for Moses. He did it for Elijah. He did it for... They're all Old Testament individuals operating under a completely different set of, uh, of, of rules in, 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 as far as he just gave... That, that whole system back there was just something for them to exercise their faith in. That's all that was. When Jesus came along and got the keys of the whole system back, we don't need that anymore. We now are born again into... A kingdom that now can get back into operating this power. So, you say, well, which gospel is the right one? The one that produces power is. So you go to a church, you go somewhere, and you plug it in and it doesn't work, I would be very disappointed. You need to go where it works, where you learn how it works, and then when you apply it for your own life, it works. This is a gospel of power. He says in, in, in Colossians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but all to us which are saved. It's the power of God which enforces the authority of God, which implements the laws of God. And you can't change laws, and nobody else can, and the devil can't. He, he, once you start operating God's laws, the devil can't do nothing. Nobody can, because it's God's laws. I can't change them, you can't change them, and they work. The power of the life that we live is in the resurrection. So like, he was saying that so close to that. Okay. Yeah, because everybody was going back. Without a resurrection, we wouldn't have this opportunity. But you know, we did that series on the Saturday mornings about, about the cross and the law and what the cross was about. And how he took... He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. And how Jesus was doing all that in his physiology, so that now when, the, when he come up the other side of the grave, that the born-again believers who were still in their physiology would have some purchased benefits called salvation, soteria, healing, deliverance, all of those things. He bought them for us because... Although I'm born again, I'm still living in this old flesh. So he paid a price back there so that even in this old flesh, I can still live victoriously. But that's what it... Say again. His, his death itself was all that was required. 
All of the stuff on the cross was to guarantee us, this far sight of it, that we would have all the benefits in our physiology of a victorious life. But his death, when God put him into that lower part, and God put upon him the iniquity of us all, that part is what satisfied God and purchased our new birth experience. Yeah, I don't think I understood the uh, power you're talking about until you did that section on uh, what happened in those three days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it works. And so we're this side of it. Everybody with me so far? All right. <laughs> I was talking to Lucy last night, and she said, so what are you doing in the morning? And I said, well, we'll just go as far as we can. It's, just, it's, a, it's, it's heavy to get into on a Tuesday morning. First, but it's going to be great, because once, once this optic changes, once you start thinking differently, as a man thinks, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. I've got to help us get our thinking get out of that old religious stuff I'm not born again into a religion I'm born again into a citizenry I'm a citizen of another kingdom I'm not a denominational Christian we've got to get out of that hole and the devil has put us in there and I'll show you why National existence. These are some civics laws, and I want to bring them up so that we understand this concept. So you'll understand, when I talk about the kingdom of heaven, I'm using the same format. But you'll understand this, because we live in this naturally. The foundation of nations are their laws. Would you agree? What makes America America is its laws, its constitution. What makes Russia, Russia, China, China is the set of laws that that community or that civility all agree to yield to. That's what gives them their difference. The foundation of nations are their laws. Nations built and sustained by laws, not culture. Culture comes out of laws. Culture comes out of law. A culture is a behavior. So when, when, when a nation brings laws to bear, people's response to those laws produce culture. Culture is not an external thing, it's an internal, it comes from inside humanity. So man under certain laws produces a response to those laws and they have a manner of life which is, we call culture. Like, for example, I, I hate mentioning this way, but it's, this is, you might have to get grasped. This country and many countries felt that abortion was the taking of a life. But then people made laws that said, ah, it's okay, your body, you can do what you want. That law was introduced into the nation. And the nation's response to that developed and changed culture. Now it's acceptable. The culture changed. The culture changed because the laws were changed. Laws and our response to laws produce culture, not the other way around. All with me? Yes, sir.
after the culture rots, then the crappy laws get put on the books, and now we have to live with what happened started four years ago. Or maybe it was the, the, the lack of the implementation of the laws back in those days. It, it, was an, it was the erosion of what were good laws by a generation who decided to push back against those laws because they wanted whatever. Um, so yes, I understand exactly what you're saying. It seems that way too. But uh, let, let, let me try, if I may, explain here when I get into the different types of, uh, of, of uh, governances. Um, because you're right. Um, some uh, lawmakers respond to um, what people want. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I get that. But it doesn't change the underlying law. No. No. Uh, again, it... It doesn't change the underlying capital L law. No, no. That's always... It changes the little case laws like water flowing out of the faucet. Exactly. They keep changing them all the time. They keep changing them. And you and I as Christ uh, believers, we now have to go back and live now. We have an opportunity to live under capital L-A-W. You have the opportunity to go into your business this morning and do business under capital L-A-W and not go down and do business under small L-A-W which are constantly changing. Which you can't predict. But if you get up under this one, you can predict it. You know where you're going. And nobody can change it. But yes, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And maybe we'll, we'll, we'll fish that out as we go through but yeah, good point, great point. The quality of a nation is determined by its laws. Nations are the laws that they embrace. Community is created by law and obedience to it, because we all agree to come around certain laws. And the advance or decline of a nation is obedience or violation of its laws. The greatest national investment is law, enforcement, security, and courts. Did you know that? Every nation spends the biggest part of their budgets, almost, are always about uh, law enforcement, security, whether that be military, and the courts. You know why? Because the nation only exists on its adherence to the laws that make it that nation. So it's very important that they get enforced. You start changing the laws or not enforcing the laws and you're going to get the crappy culture or the crappy response in life where people do whatever they want and you do this for them but you don't do it for them and yet it says you're to do it for all. Now you start doing all of that stuff and then they all want to jump in and start lawmakers then start changing laws to suit this disobedience to law which is the decline of a nation still with me all right civil society relies on law for safety prosperity and development you have to have it in order to advance you don't want anarchy you want law but you want good laws. And, and if men are making them, you want men to make laws that, that take their mark from God. It's what made this nation the awesome nation that it has been since its creation, formation. Because men wrote a constitution based on, leaned toward the, the capital L. They made mistakes, they didn't get it perfect, but they, they got it as best they could. You start to deviate away from the capital L, it's, it's just, it becomes a mess. So, types of governance. There's monarchies. Monarchies. They're just the kings and queens, and they carry out the everybody else or subjects to that. There's communism, where everything's common. Normally it's one party that runs it and nobody else gets a chance to get in and run that, but they decide, you know, we're all equal, we're all the same, uh, we're all comrades. I'm comrade number one, by the way. Uh, you're not comrade number one. You can be comrade number whatever, but I'm comrade number one. But we are all equal. All right. I, I won't get into all that. Okay. Uh, uh, autocracy. Autocracy. 
I, 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 it's just where, where you know, one individual sort of, uh, it, it, they govern, but they, they, they're in charge. They, you, can't, you can't oust them. Castro, for example, people like that, uh, uh, you would have called them dictatorial, but what they do is they have an election and they elect themselves in and then you can't get them out because they sort of make the laws themselves. And, and, and then you have uh, oligars, oligar, oligarchs. These are people that are very wealthy, highly influential people, and they really run the system. Um, and then you have uh, uh, aristocracy, uh, and noble, uh, noblemen and type, uh, again, well-born people, so to speak. Fascism, dicta, dicta, uh, dictatorial or dicta, dictatorship. Democracy, which is probably the better of them all. And then that democracy goes into two. There's democracy where, where the people have their say, or then we have republic where the people vote other people to make the laws for them. Okay? And then there's theocracy. Anybody know what a theocracy is? The church. Nope. The church. Nope. Theos is the, the word for God. A theocracy is that God runs it. Thing about a theocracy is it's not a democracy. A theocracy is God's in charge. God didn't ask us for our opinion. Did you know that? When God gave laws, He didn't say, "What do you think?" In fact, God took those days of restoration and, and, and recreation in the Book of Genesis, and the last person He, the last thing He created was what? Man. Do you know why He created man last? He didn't want our opinion. He didn't want our opinion as to what, what we should do. God knew what we should do. God didn't, God didn't ask us. He doesn't need to ask us. He's God, for goodness sake. It's a theocracy. You and I are part of a theocracy, but what's wrong is we treat our belief system like a democracy. Here, God, I'll do this, you do that. Huh? I don't know why he gave us one. I'm still trying to work that one out. He knew. He obviously put him asleep when he did it. So he thought, I don't want no comments from you, pal. Here we go. So man's still been wondering. That's another question we've got to ask when we meet him. But this, this, it's a theocracy. But we, we try to barter with God. We try to deal with God and with church and through church. Like we're trying to get God, we're trying to influence God, we're trying to behoove God, we're trying to open his tight fistedness to do something for him. I mean, why can't you own everything? Why don't you just And God's looking at us going to you just have the you are looking at me through a democracy optic. It is not a democracy, it's a theocracy. I tell you, you do it. Period. You know, I think I'll go to church now and again. Forsake not the assembly. He tells us, don't, don't, don't miss these opportunities. What we do here in Bible Optics, every time I sit up here, we're going to teach kingdom laws. We're teaching how to change our thinking to enjoy what Jesus won for us. But the football's on. I know that. It's a great night for barbecue. I understand that too. And we wonder then why this power that it talks about and this authority of which that power is to enforce or that authority of, of which laws they are to implement, why it never gets done is because the truth of the matter, we spend 52 hours a year in obedience, maybe going on a Sunday morning to church. And we think that we can change a mindset when we live the rest of the time in a, in a democracy or in a dictatorial regime or an autocratic regime or a fascist regime or a communist regime. And, and we want our book to work. You have to change the optic. That's why he said, be not conformed to these systems, but be transformed, metamorphosized by the renewing of your Thinking, you ha you cannot operate from this book with democracy optic. It doesn't work. 
It doesn't work. You can't barter with God. You obey God or you disobey God. <laughs> Do you understand? It's, it's, it, I know it might be hard just to get your head around, but this is, the, this is what we've done. Monarchy, communism, autocracy, and all these others are, are, are forms of human government. And they were formed by man, because man was designed to govern. Do you remember that? God said, let them have dominion. Genesis 1.26. Let them have dominion over all the earth. Well, under the fall, man is still hardwired to govern, but he wasn't doing it under the influence of God. He was now doing it under the influence of sin, and this is what he came up with. This is how we governed ourselves. Some of it was good and some of it was bad. But this is human governance. You still all with me? Human governance. And then theocracy, which was the way it was in, always intended to be. God would come down and walk and talk with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day. And it was out of that relationship that they were to go into the world and, and, and rule it and govern it. When man lost that privilege, lost that input, lost that download, Man was still hardwired to govern, but without God and under the influence of sin, that's the bunch he came up with. Yes, sir? But God being all knowing, you say he intended for a theocracy. Yeah. But he had to know Adam was going to, and he was not going to work out the way he planned, and all this was going to happen. Right? Mm -hmm. You have to look at let's put Adam up here. Right, this this was up here. Okay? Theocracy. That's what originally started. When a theocracy was introduced to Adam, Adam was in a state of anybody remember what that dispensation was? Adam was in a state of innocence. He was innocent. God made him. He didn't know evil. Did you know that? Did you know Adam didn't know what evil was? Until Eve came around. <laughs> <laughs> now, for anybody who's watching that, and I never said that. I'm not going to call your name out loud, but she'll kill you when you get you home. This original theocracy, when it was introduced to Adam, Adam was innocent and God told him he said Adam look at that garden you can take anything you want out of it it's all yours oh by the way and I've got to give you some stand. I've got to give you something that, where you have to make a choice because you're a free will being you're a free will creature do you see that tree over there now he didn't pick a certain tree uh, as in an apple tree or an orange. He just picked a tree because it was all good. God made everything good. He didn't make a tree of evil. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above, it says in James. So he didn't make an evil tree and said, don't eat of that, that's an evil tree. He didn't do that. He just picked a tree. He said, see that one there? Adam goes, yeah. He said, don't eat of that. Why? It was none of your business, why? Just don't eat of it, because I said don't eat of it. Don't pass the corner of the street. You're not allowed to cross that road. Why? You're too young to ask why. You're innocent. Just don't cross it. How many of you have gone through that in life? Right, Adam was innocent. So he said, it wasn't that the tree was evil. He said, but here's the deal. If you do, Adam, the day that you do, you're going to learn something that you don't know now. You're going to have the knowledge of good and evil. Problem is, when you discover that, you're going to fall out from under this. And you're going to end up under sin. Because you'll have done something I told you not to do. So, when Adam was under a theocracy, he was under a theocracy in innocence. He didn't know evil. And when he did, he lost the privilege and was influenced by this. 
with the new birth experience, now that I'm born again, I can be born again and know good and evil and still be righteous before God, which was much better than anything Adam had. I'm a different creature altogether. This theocracy and Adam's theocracy, what's down here now is a new creature. This is a completely different creature than Adam was. If any man be in Christ, he is a new species. I'm not in Adam anymore. I'm in Christ. And my theocracy, I know good and evil. And I still am righteous. Not because of what I do. Or not because I know good and evil. But because of what Jesus did. That gets me in. But now from that advantage, I can now go back to a theocracy and operate under capital L's that are predictable. How are we doing? Too much? Exactly. No, but the reason is because all of the all of the dysfunctionality and hatred and variance and malice and anger and lust and all that stuff came in. And they didn't understand what was going on. They didn't. It was because what Adam did and everybody after that now just took this as the status quo. We were raised in this and got born again into this. Our problem is we have to understand what this is and stop trying to operate this from this optic and the whole the whole difference of these two regimes is this one is ignorance it's called darkness this one is called knowledge and it's called light and when we read it in the scriptures that's what we're going to see Jesus said I am the light of this he wasn't a bulb he didn't say I'm a bulb he came in and said, I'm the illumination of your ignorance. Men lived in this ignorance. The Bible says if the God of this world has hid the gospel from, has blinded what? What, what did the devil do? He has blinded what? The minds of those. At least they should see the truth. He, when we say blinded, blindedness is darkness. When we talk in the scripture, and we'll do it next week. When we talk about light and darkness, light and darkness, I'm in the kingdom of light. That's what this means. I know what I, I know how this works. If if you continue in the truth, you'll know the truth. If you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Free from this. Free from this set of principles. Sorry, Rob. In the blue pill. Correct. I use the matrix all the time, Rob, because I, I, I agree with that. I think it's a great analogy of, of what we're dealing with. All of this, all of what we see here, is, is that myth. It, it, is, it is what we understand as governance. And we haven't truly understood that this is really what we were designed to do. This is where God wants us to be. This is where he wants us to go. And, and when we understand that, that the way we get out of this, into this, or, or the way we get out from operating under this ignorance and get into operating is through knowledge of the word of God. That's <laughs> Join the club. But uh, any, any other questions? Because we're going to close on that. Everybody doing okay? Good Tuesday morning? Uh, huh? <laughs> I'm glad to be back. 
All right, well, we're going to launch out from there next week. And we're going to start talking about um, light and darkness um, and how important it is to spend time, make time, take time to, to, to sit in under the Word of God. It is so important. That's why most Christians just don't get to enjoy everything God done. 